Good afternoon, Living Praise. Today's scripture reading is taken from, firstly, Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. Next, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, and Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 to 17. If you have your Bible, please turn with me to these passages. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Verse 7, the Lord said, I've indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering." So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hevites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians were oppressing them. So now, go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. Next, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Finally, Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 to 17. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of God. Come, let us go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for your word, uh, your word which reveals uh, who you are, your word which reveals uh, your goodness uh, towards uh, your people. 
And Father, we pray uh, that you help us to be attentive yeah, so that uh, we can hear your voice as we uh, look at the third commandment. And we pray uh, that you will help us to live out the truth as your people are here in living praise uh, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good afternoon once again. Today we look at the third commandment, the commandment that concerns a God's a name. And names, as you know it, are special. Just ask any parent here uh, how, uh, how long it takes them uh, to think of names uh, for their uh, children and why. Because somehow your name represents uh, your character or what you hope for in your child. You want your child uh, to grow up, to follow or to embody uh, the name uh, that uh, you give them. And that is why nicknames, yeah? when people make fun of your names, when they call you names, it's so hurtful because you are assigning something that is not true to the name of someone. And names not only represent our, our character, if you look at the Bible, that's also how it is when names are given in Scripture. So for example, God gives the name Abraham to Abraham. And why does he give the name Abraham? Because Abraham means I made you a father of many nations. This is what God is going to do for Abraham. He's going to make him the father of many nations. So God gives Abraham the name Abraham. The name Isaac, for example, when God promised Abraham, I'm going to give you, I'm going to come back and you're going to have a child. And Abraham laughed, okay? And the name Isaac means he who laughs. And that's why uh, God gave uh, the name Isaac uh, to Isaac. And uh, the name Jacob. The name Jacob just means uh, he grasped uh, the heel. And that's what Jacob did. When Jacob came up, Jacob and Esau, they were twins. And when Jacob, the baby Jacob came up, he was holding uh, the heel of Esau. And that name was given to him. So names represent our the character, the character of a person. And today we come to commandment number three. So for those of us, or those of you who are just new, who joined us this week, or joined us last week, last week we had mission week. So this Sunday we return to our series on the ten commandments. And we had two other commandments prior to that. So a short summary. This is how the ten commandments actually begin. Exodus chapter 20 verse 1 and verse Two, where God speaks these words. And notice the Ten Commandments, they do not begin actually with commandment number one, but they begin with God telling Israel, I am the Lord, your God. This is who I am and what did I do? I brought you out of Egypt, out of the hand of slavery. That's how the Ten Commandments actually begin in other words, the Ten Commandments actually start with a word of grace. This is what I have done. And it's a set of instructions given to God people to tell them, this is how you are to live now that you belong to me, now that I have rescued you. So that's commandment number one. So how do we live a grace-filled life? When we live life as God has rescued us to live in the Ten Commandments, Commandments. Commandment number one, as we remember, yeah, the New City Catechism that Kenneth reminded us, the song uh, that we uh, looked at just now, you shall have no other gods before me. So the first commandment looks at the exclusivity of this relationship because God has rescued his people out of Egypt. Who do God's people belong to? Yeah, who does God's people belong to? He belongs to God, yeah? so God deserves our wholehearted devotion to him. We are to have no other gods before our God and it stems from God's rescue. We belong to God, God has rescued us, so no other gods before him. So that's commandment number one. Commandment number two, the second commandment, looks at how God's people are to relate to him how we are to worship or serve 
God, it says, you shall not make yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. How are we to rightly worship God? We are to worship God as who he really is. So when God revealed himself to Israel, there was no form, there was only a voice. So how do we as God's people relate rightly to God? We relate rightly to him, we worship him when we hear his word and we obey his word. And that is why the teaching and reading of God's word is central to our gathering. Yeah, so those are the two commandments, the two talks um, that we looked at uh, previously. If you want to hear more about it, if you are new with us, please tune in to our website where the messages are kept. So today we looked at commandment number three. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. So many of us, when we look at this uh, commandment here, we think it's just a prohibition about using God's name as a swear word, a meaning, oh my, okay, I cannot say that, nah? and what follows. And because it's, oh, we can let our guard down a bit. Yeah, very easy, just have to watch my lips, just make sure I do not swear. Now, of course, this kind of speech is wrong and we shouldn't do it. We shouldn't use God's name as a swear word. But there are other ways in which God's name was used disrespectfully in the Old Testament. And let me just share three ways in which this was done so in Old Testament times. So firstly, it's a warning against using God's name in sorcery. Okay, So it says here, Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or is a medium or spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is accessible to the Lord because the same detestable practices the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. So one way of misusing God's name is using it in sorcery. And why? Because people believe they could access great powers of God by using the divine names of God. So you are manipulating God. Yeah? You, 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 you use certain names and and that is why this was very detestable to God. So that's in the Old Testament time. A modern day equivalent would be how we can sometimes use God's name in superstitious rituals uh, or charms, you know, use God's name to bring uh, luck uh, to you or to ward off evil. Yeah, that is something that's uh, not Detest, it's detestable to God. So that's the first thing. You can misuse your God in sorcery. When you use God's name to bring about a certain outcome, you are using God's name. The second way in which it is used, wrongly used in the Old Testament, is actually false prophecy, okay, where prophets would come about and say, thus said the Lord. And these were prophets who would actually prophesy falsely, but using God's a name, misusing it to make it seem as if it is something that God has said. So here God warns against it in Jeremiah 14. Then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies, notice lies, but it's in my name. I have not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you false visions divinations, idolatries, and the delusion of their own minds. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about the prophets who are prophesying in my name. I did not send them, yet they are saying, no sword or famine will touch this land. Those same prophets will perish by sword and famine. Okay? So that was one way in which it was misused, 
God's name was misused in the Old Testament, a time when people say this is what the Lord says. Modern day equivalent would be perhaps a uh, gospel teachers would come, so for someone on, on, on stage or a, a Bible teacher would come and would lay claim to certain things. Uh. Yeah, God actually uh, said uh, this. So for example, uh, I had a dream uh, and, and God actually told me uh, this thing and they, and, and they use God's name uh, for their own gain uh, to influence you in something okay so that's something in which uh, we are not to do because you are misusing god's name uh, when that happens god has spoken clearly to us he has spoken in his uh, word yeah so don't use god's name to bring about your own agenda or something so this is something in which uh, bible teachers we need to be careful and i uh, use it of my uh, self uh, when you say you no know, god actually said this when god actually did not say it the other way in which in the Old Testament times it can be misused is when people swear falsely by God's name. Yeah, when you want to say this thing is true, then you would say, God actually, uh, I swear uh, by uh, God's uh, name. Yeah, but it is not true. So don't actually uh, swear uh, by God's uh, name. This does not mean that we actually cannot make oaths. Uh, we can actually take oaths yeah, in, in court because you are actually saying something that is true. But this is an instance where you are saying something that is not true and you are using God's name uh, to substantiate uh, this. So these are some examples in the Old Testament times on top of things like blasphemy where you use God's name as a curse, a word uh, where there is disrespect for God's name and in each of these instances which we see there God's name his character is not honored because you're attributing either something false or you're using his name and character for your own personal gain and you're bringing this honor to it and attached to this commandment is actually a warning you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. So notice there is a warning attached, but the exact warning is not specified. The only thing that is said is, the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Meaning if you misuse God's name, you are guilty. Notice the reason why it puts it this way. Because sometimes you want to make something, you want to make an, an, an important a claim, you use less words to show the importance of it. So, you know, those of you, yeah, if you, you are serving under someone who is, un, you're under someone who is an authority over you, and then they say to you these words, I wouldn't do that. If I were you. Notice this is not just a casual opinion. It is quite a stern warning. I don't know whether kids, sometimes your parents say that to you. Huh? I wouldn't do that if I were you. <laughs> yeah? It's actually something serious. Huh? Sometimes, even though the, the sentence there is very little, it just says uh, very briefly, God will not hold anyone guilt, uh, guiltless. It's actually something very serious because when you misuse the name of the Lord you are attacking his honor and his glory it's a bit like this yeah you know we've all uh, recently I think maybe a few months back in the news you've heard about Lee Sing Yang yeah making false allegations against ministers K Shamugam and Vivian Balakrishnan about their rentals of uh, Ride Out Road. Remember? I think a few months back, what was the outcome of the false allegations put on Facebook? Yeah, Lee Sen Yang ordered to pay 200000 each. Okay, that means 
200,000 to Shanmugam, 200,000 to Vivian Balakrishnan for defamation. So 200,000, a lot of money, right? Times two, you know, 400,000. Why such a huge amount of money? Because his words is suggesting that the ministers are involved with corrupt practices. It is an attack on a minister's integrity and their honour. So notice, friends, if this is how seriously the law of the land takes against practices against our ministers, how much more so when someone misuses God's name? Yeah, so it's something that is quite serious. So this now, I, I gave you all some examples of how we can misuse the name of the Lord. But really, when we look at the negative side of it, no? how we misuse the name of the Lord is actually the bare minimum of the commandment. Because there is something very special about a name. There are two things about a name. First is, a name is something that we use to identify ourselves. So for example, when I see Lionel and Louis there, right? I don't go, a boy, a boy. Because they have name, right? They have their Lionel and... Louis, I can identify them. But the special thing about a name is this. A name opens up an invitation to relationship. So for example, this name tag here, right? It says, my name, Yo Yi Fu, but it says, hello, my name is Yo Yi. It's an invitation for you to get to know a me. And that's why, you know, a lot of times when you go out in public, right, a lot of the salesperson come, they want to ask you to fill in form to put in your name. You don't want to give them your name. Why? Because I don't want a relationship with someone going to sell me this product. Right? I only give my name to my friends, uh, to people who know me, to people, yeah, that I open up to a relationship. And that's actually what we learn in the Bible reading earlier that Sulian actually read to us. In Exodus chapter 3, you know the incident of the burning bush. It's a bush that's on fire, but it's not burning up. So there's fire there, but the bush somehow is uh, it's not burning. It's, it's, there's fire there. Okay? But God actually knows. He says, I've indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. God knows that his people are slaves in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hevites and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So here we see before God gives his name, he knows what's happening among his people and he's about to act. And then there's this conversation between Moses and God. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. You will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I, shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me. To you, God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, the Lord. So the word the Lord there actually is God's personal name. And the word there actually is short for I am who I am. I am or in the footnotes in your Bible, you have I will be what I will be. Say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name, the Lord, or in the Hebrew, is Yahweh. Actually, we don't know how it's actually pronounced because uh, in the Old Testament times, uh, 
the Jews wanted to be very, very careful about not misusing God's name. So they did not leave uh, instructions on how the name was meant to be pronounced. Uh, so we do not know. But most likely, it's actually uh, that this is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. So what is the meaning of uh, Yahweh uh, or the Lord? I am who I am or I will be what I will be. So uh, scholars tell us there are, there are ways of understanding this. So this, those are the four. Uh, God is self-existent and an independent being. He is the creator, sustainer of everything. God is unchangeable and so always reliable. God is eternal in his existence. In other words, what does God's name tell us about him, the person? It tells us that he is perfect, all-powerful. He is someone who is dependable because he is unchanging character. Okay, so that's in Genesis chapter 3. But what's really, really special about God's name is that God didn't just reveal or tell people his name. He didn't just say, look, Moses, tell the people, this is my name. He revealed his character expressed by his name to them. So Exodus chapter 6. Let me just read this passage. So God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Notice something very strange, right? Because if you read passages in Genesis, for example, people actually were calling on the name of the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And if you read passages in, in Exodus and Genesis, the word the L-O-R-D in capital letters actually is there. So when God appeared to the patriarchs, he actually appeared and, and they also knew his name. But then he says here, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. So what was missing or lacking in the name that God revealed to them? What knowledge did they not have? So let's see how the second paragraph helps to answer it. So therefore says to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from Egypt. Sorry, I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then what will you know when that happens? Then you will know, know fully that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians and I will bring you into the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. So what will God do to the Israelites so that he will be fully known by his name. He will rescue them. And when God rescues his people, then they will know and experience his perfect, all-powerful, dependable character. It's a bit like this. Let's say you have a child, right? You name her Grace. Yeah, Grace actually means unmerited favor. You know her as grace. But then let's say you are married to her and you, you, you know her character, uh, you, you do something wrong and she uh, forgives you. Uh, you now not only know her name, because you used to know her name before, but you come to know her, her name, her character, for who she really is. No longer just a name, grace, but grace, a merited favor, the person who forgives you, 
freely, who shows you grace. God has made known his personal name, Yahweh, to his people. When he redeemed them from slavery to Egypt, and in experiencing God's rescue, God's people have fully known Yahweh as their God. And that is why God's people, Israel, very special, not only knew God's name, but they were now meant to be his representatives. God actually set his name on his people. In Exodus 19, verse 3 to verse 6, just before the Ten Commandments, God actually tells his people, you are going to be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy a nation. In other words, they are they will be something like ambassadors, isn't it? When God's people, when they remain faithful to the Lord, then God's name will be honoured. It will be glorified. But if God's people go around and don't live life according to God's word, his reputation would actually suffer. If you remember, I think a few months back or a few weeks back, when we looked at the Lord's Prayer, we looked at this passage called Ezekiel 36. Remember? And we said the problem back then was God's people, they didn't just misuse God's name, but by their living, their conduct and their actions, they brought dishonour to God's name. It's a bit... Like this. Uh, so those of you, okay, Kochuan, I, okay, I, I don't want to use Lionel on Blue Yesterday, but other Kochuan kids that are here, let's say uh, Chloe is here, here too. Yeah? Chloe, like let's say when you wear the Kochuan shirt, the Kochuan uniforms, for example, and you go to J8, oh, Ned is here as well. Yeah? And, and what happens when you don't behave, when you misbehave? Firstly, your parents will maybe scold you, yeah, yeah like uh, the way will, will, will scold you. But it's not just that, you know, when you wear your school uniform and you misbehave, what happens? You bring actually a bad reputation to the name of your school because you're representing your school, you're wearing the badge. And this is what happened to God's people back in the Old Testament. Yeah, when they uh, defiled the land by their conduct and their actions and they, pro and they profane God's holy name. God sent his people to exile. But the good news of the gospel is this. God continued to love his people and at the right time he sent his son into the world. At his birth, God's son, what name was he given? Sunday school answer. Jesus. And what does Jesus mean? Jesus, the name was given because he will save his people from their sins. So we, God's church, we not only know the name of Jesus, but we have experienced what his name truly represents. And we know what Jesus means because 2,000 years ago, Jesus, who is truly God, truly man, obedient to God, was crucified. He died the death that you and I deserve so that we can have forgiveness of sin. So we too know truly the name of Jesus. But not only that, we as God's people, we also bear his name. And that's why the Bible passage that Sulean read to us, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. If there's one, uh, I think one lesson to take away is this. Uh, when we look at the third commandment, it's not just about misusing the name of God, but it's about us. We bear the name of Jesus and our words and our actions can have 
in the effect of two, two effects. Uh. It can either cause the people around us or cause God's name to be honoured and glorified, or our words and our action can cause God's name to be dishonoured and bring it into this uh, repute. So the challenge I want to leave with us here today is this. Uh, whatever you do, whatever you say, and whatever you do with your hands, in your home, in your workplaces, in your schools, remember you are wearing a badge uh, that says you belong to God, you are a Christian. So how can your words and your action make the name of Jesus more attractive? Yeah, what can you say or what can you stop saying? What can you continue to do or what, can you, or what should you stop doing that can make people look and say, wow, he is a Christian. I want <clears throat> to know his God. Wow, I read in the, I, 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 I know this person, Jesus, he says he's patient, kind and forgiving. And I think it's true because I see uh, the, the life of my Christian a worker. And for some people, our words and our action can lead them to call on the name of Jesus and be saved because that is what truly brings honour to God. Or our words and actions can make Jesus a repulsive and bring this repute to his name. So brothers and sisters in Christ, our young ones, yeah, those of you who are in school, our adults, you are in our workplaces, those who are more senior, or whether we like it or not, we are wearing badges for Jesus. How we live and what we say really matters. So let this be a challenge for us, an encouragement for us uh, to let our speech be wholesome, to build people uh, up and erase from our vocabulary uh, words that should not be mentioned. Include words like, please, thank you. And one other area that we should consider also is our online and social media presence. Yeah, all, all of us, we are on not all of us, uh, maybe those of us who are younger, we are on social media. Yeah, we have a social media presence. What impact does it have on the people around us? Uh? As a Christian, yeah, how are we responding uh, to when there's online disagreement, disagreements? Are there ways in which we can exercise grace? We can respect the person that we are in contact with. So these are some areas in which we can honour the name of Jesus. So brothers and sisters, as those who have truly come to know the name of Jesus, we've been saved from our sins. May the words of our lips, the actions of our hands, bring honour and glory to the name that we bear. Let us pray. Father, thank you that we have truly come to know the name of our Lord Jesus. For once we were dead in our sins, but Father, you sent your Son Jesus to die for us on the cross so we can be made right with you. So help us all, Father, who bear the name of Jesus. May our, the words of our lips, the actions of our hand, bring honour and glory to your name, the name that we bear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.